Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you, Asia Society, for having me and for everyone in this room and everyone who's joining online as well. Uh, so the art of storytelling is a very ambitious topic, but I'll be slicing and dicing this topic and really focusing on uh, language, no theater, uh, documentary films, and the recent uh, AI trends. Some of you may be aware of the uh, book Sapiens, uh, written by Yuav Harari. But he, he talks um, extensively about the complexity of human language and how that has helped us survive. So, of course, other animals have languages as well. But uh, let's say if there's a predator in front of us, you know, maybe animals will be able to say, like, danger, you know, lion. But in the case of Homo sapiens and our language, uh, our language was more precise and we could uh, identify the lion, the location, and even tactics uh, to uh, survive and protect ourselves. So that gives us a, you know, a new appreciation for the role of language. Uh, so this stone was found in the Blombos Cave in South Africa. Um, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but there, there are marks on the stone. Uh, National Geographic calls these marks doodles. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, maybe someone in this room to guess how old this stone is. Maybe someone in, in the back. <laughs> 50, oh, that's very good. That's good. It's, uh, yes, 50, we have uh, 50,000 as a guess. Uh, it's 73,000 years old. Um, and it just, it just shows that this was also part of our, our repertoire uh, when it comes to, to language. Now, I'm going to be jumping a few centuries ahead uh, when it comes to theater. Uh, you know, I, I could have looked at many different forms of storytelling from, from, from art to, to dance to theater, but um, I'll be focusing on no theater today. Um, so uh, no theater has a long history. Uh, some of you may be aware that the roots of no theater come from uh, Sangaku. Uh, from the 8th century, which evolved and, and transformed into Sarugaku. And uh, what we see today is, is really uh, from the 14th century. And, and I love to point out that Sangaku uh, actually, you know, the, the roots of no theater came from China in, in the 8th century, which shows how interconnected we are as, as humans. Uh, and in my father's family, uh, no theater has been passed down for, from father to son, <coughs> for over 600 uh, years. And uh, Ezra Pound, who's an American poet, uh, you know, really sees no theater in high regard and, and says that no is unquestionably one of the great arts of the world, and it is quite possibly one of the most recondite, meaning you know, hard to understand, like <laughs> very kind of uh, obscure. Um, but what I love about no theater is, um, you know, the storytelling, just, uh, just the, the richness of, of the stories, uh, the dynamic movements, um, but also the stillness that you can observe on stage. And, you know, oftentimes people say that when they see no theater, it can transport them to an ancient world. Uh, how many of you have seen no theater? Okay, okay, about half of the, the room here today. Um, so I'm going to go back to Yuav Harari's book, Sapiens, um, because he talks about the importance of um, myth and, and how uh, humans uh, have this ability to, uh, you know, think abstractly, you know, think about myth and things that are not physically tangible uh, and how that has helped us survive as well as a species because um, that helped us form identities. And so that also was quite helpful on the battle field, for example, where you didn't have to meet someone to trust them and, and feel this kinship with someone else. So going back to no theater, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of storytelling in, in no. Some people ask me, are there stories in no? Absolutely. Um, so this is a, a painting uh, depicting Dojoji. Uh, and uh, Dojoji is about uh, this lady who, who loves this very handsome Buddhist priest, um, but he doesn't love her in return and he's trying to escape from her. Um, but what happens is uh, she's so enraged that she transforms into a, a serpent, a fire-spitting serpent, and the priest uh, hides in, under a temple bell, and she wraps, the, the serpent snake wraps around the bell, and the bell melts um, and the, you know, with, the, with the priest inside it. 
Uh, and, and this is a slightly happier story. Um, you know, it's, it's a play called Shoujo, and it's about a sea creature who loves sake. And uh, it says the moon is floating, uh, one of the um, scenes from, no, um, says the moon is floating in a cup of liquor. I myself am flo floating out tonight. So, so next time you uh, enjoy a cup of sake, please think of, <laughs> of Shoujo, this play Shoujo. Now, when it comes to my involvement in No, um, I did have my first stage appearance at the age of three uh, at the National No Theatre. But recently, um, I've been collaborating with my father on um, producing and directing contemporary No Theatre productions. So this is, um, comes from a play called Hell Says No. And it was in collaboration with the Brazilian government. Uh, and we performed at the, at the Panasonic Center in Tokyo. Uh, so my father, you know, plays the role of the Brazilian gangster, uh, and this this actually, this story comes from Brazil's uh, literature called Cordel, and that's like one of the main reasons why the Brazilian government was quite excited to to collaborate with us because they really wanted to promote um, their cultural heritage, Cordel literature. So we um, this was actually in celebration of the Olympics coming from um, Brazil to to Japan. And it's about a, a Brazilian gangster who attempts to enter hell, but Satan says, you're such a nuisance, like get, out of, get the hell out of here. Um, and uh, the, the Brazilian gangster ends up you know, in invading hell and destroying it. Uh, and he fights against uh, Satan's devils. And once uh, hell is destroyed, uh, there's a passage where um, that says winter will come here early here in hell. Winter will come early here in hell. So I think these sort of expressions, you know, new expressions of no theater are exciting because it, it also um, kind of piques people's curiosity about what is possible within, within the world of no. And uh, it, it is, what was quite great, great about this production is that we saw even like very young children attend and enjoy the production. So we're constantly thinking of ways to um, have the, you know, these um, forms of expression accessible to new audiences. Um, this this production here was uh, in collaboration with Toraya, the the confectionery group, and uh, it was an outdoor performance. Uh, also, my father is is the main character, and this was a, uh, you know, we we co-directed this together. And it's about a wagashi, sweet Japanese sweets maker, who transforms into a moon spirit. And so this was done uh, last year. Uh, so, so again, the, the, the role of, of myth and even transformation um, it ha ha has a big role in no the theater. Uh, moving on to, to films. Um, so I, I come from a background of, uh, my background is, is in, in documentaries mainly. Um, but I'd like to sort of skip a few <laughs> centuries ahead from, from no, no theater to, to films. Um, and here's a, a question to the audience. Like how many Hollywood films are produced annually in the 1920s? So any guess from the, the table? <laughs> thousand, a thousand, yeah, that's actually very good. Um, uh, I would say about 800, which is which is a lot because um, annually today, at least in the the realm of Hollywood, uh, it's about four like 450 um, today. Uh, and there were actually a lot of people going to the cinemas uh, back in the in the the 1920s. Um, now, of course, the the definition of film uh, is a little broad here, but I have a few numbers on this slide to depict how the the chain you know that you know dramatic changes in the, the film industry, um, you know, thanks to social media. So could you, could you guess, Jack, what some of these numbers represent? <laughs> so now it's a million. I don't know the number of uh, video produced on YouTube, for instance. Would be 500 million. <laughs> good. Yeah, no, good, good, good guess. So um, I'll, any, any guesses behind? Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll give you a hint. So these are some of the platforms um, that we regularly use today. Okay, so I'll, I'll, yes, correct, correct, correct. So 
at the top, so this is actually not an annual calculation, but a daily uh, calculation. So uh, 3.7 million um, videos produced, uh, uploaded daily on YouTube, uh, 500 million uh, reels, uh, basically 500 million users creating 500 million uh, reels on Instagram on a daily basis, and 34 million uh, TikTok videos uh, uploaded <laughs> on a daily basis. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because that also kind of changes how we consume uh, information. Uh, so when I was um, talking to uh, some, some young teenagers uh, from France the other day uh, in Kyoto, they, they were very keen on, on um, seeing uh, geishas because they saw that on, on TikTok. So I think the way we're consuming uh, information is, is radically changing. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit more about uh, my experience as a, as a documentary filmmaker, um, I, I think I was very curious about, uh, you know, stories of uh, adversity, like so people who lived in, in ad adversity, environments of adversity, and, and how they uh, overcame that um, by really focusing on the, the creative culture that exists. Um, so, for example, when I was uh, filming in the favelas of, of Rio de Janeiro, um, there are all these um, biases and preconceptions against people who live in the favelas of, of Rio. Um, and sometimes I would ask the audience, like, what percentage of people do you think uh, are involved in drug trafficking uh, and, and these sort of crimes? And sometimes the, the number would go up like 40, 50, 60 percent. Um, but actually, the reality is that less than one percent of people are involved in, in drug trafficking in the favelas of Rio. But then, of course, when you're looking at all, all the headlines on, on newspapers, you know, you've, we have this tendency to just focus on the bad news. And then um, a lot of people end up sort of distorting. Well, not kind of that kind of distorts our perception of, of how bad the reality is is. So that was like one of my main inspirations for making documentaries uh, and actually promoting uh, discussions um, with the audience in, in places like this. Um, so really focusing on um, the discussions right after the, the screenings uh, that took place in, in film festivals. Uh, but but I, I realized that the future of content is online. And so um, I joined YouTube um, and, and I was at YouTube for about six years, uh, but I was very interested in, in how people brand themselves, uh, how they sort of capture the audience of the online viewers. And um, of course, uh, even when I made, for example, this, this uh, ninja action film uh, with my brother, um, I, I wasn't focusing on promoting uh, discussions uh, for, during screenings. I was, I was focusing on, um, you know, maybe some key words like, how can this video be shareable online? Like, what would people say when they share this video with their friends or family? So, so that the, the, the focus uh, shifted. And I think the other thing that's kind of interesting about um, YouTube and some of these platforms in comparison to traditional TV is that there is this level of interaction with your audience. And so um, a lot of like great YouTube creators, uh, they often interact with their viewers and um, shape their content based on the feedback that they're receiving. Uh, now, moving on to AI, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about AI, uh, mostly because of generative AI. Um, and I, I actually asked ChatGBT this, this question about whether AI art is less valuable than art created by humans. And uh, it, it came up with a very nuanced uh, answer, um, such as, you know, AI-generated art often raises questions about the nature of creativity, authorship, and the role of technology in artistic creation. And, you know, ultimately the value of art is often in the eyes of the beholder. So I, I, I found, you know, this answer to be quite nuanced. Um, but it's it's quite startling, startling and surprising uh, how how kind of like storytellers are leveraging a generative art uh, today. And so uh, this artist um, made an animation film um, using um, basically Mid Journey and this tool called Gen Two. And I'll, I'll play some of the I'll play a little bit of the video. 
residents are feeling quite charged up as unexplained glitches and power outages run rampant, turning daily life into a comically electrifying experience. Mrs. Ruth Bolt, a 67-year-old resident of the town, was reported saying, I tried to toast my bread this morning, but instead it flew out of the toaster and stuck to the ceiling. I guess I'm having an upside-down sandwich today. What's causing these electric escapades? Theories? So I'll stop there, but it's it's pretty remarkable that um, just with many two tools, right? So, so Mid Journey and Gen 2, this artist was able to uh, create, you know, such a, a, a beautiful uh, animation. Uh, and then uh, recently, uh, I had a chance to speak with an Austrian composer uh, who worked with a, a team of mus musicologists and scientists to uh, complete uh, Beethoven's unfinished uh, Tenth Symphony, uh, also using uh, AI. So, so there's some very interesting projects out there of, of artists um, and even scientists uh, leveraging AI to produce artworks. Now, of course, um, it does come with limitations. AI does come with limitations. So this uh, Wired article uh, focuses on, um, you know, even the best algorithms struggling to recognize black faces equally, and that um, even some of these facial recognition systems misidentify um, black uh, people's faces at rates five to ten times higher than they do um, of white people. And so, um, you know, it's, it's important to sort of understand the, the limitations of, of AI and, and see how we can uh, improve, improve upon it. And of course, there are um, biases in the system, uh, you know, prejudice, pr propaganda, uh, maybe lack of diversity of, of data sets and things like that. But it's, it's really uh, our, our responsibility to uh, sort of address, address these concerns. Um, so as an experiment um, with, um, you know, a platform called Midjourney, um, I asked uh, Midjourney to submerge a no theater mask into the ocean, um, just using text. And it came up with these masks, which doesn't quite look like a no theater mask. Uh, and and it's, it's okay that, I mean, it's still impressive that you have the mask in, a, in the ocean, but it's not quite a, a no theater mask. So then I took this image um, and I asked, place this image into the ocean. Uh, I said, uh, I, the prompt was submerge this mask in an ocean in the style of an impressionist painting. And it still kind of came up with, it, I, I think it did a slightly better job than, than the previous, um, you know, generative AI images, but it, it's still not quite a, a no theater mask. Um, so, so again, it kind of raises like questions about um, the, the available data sets out there uh, and how that um, kind of shapes uh, the, the you know different narratives in, in the image and film space. Uh, and I also asked uh, to convert this image uh, you know of my father performing into a vibrant animation, and uh, it sort of kind of showed images of, of geishas or you know, people, uh, you know, I guess characters from, from anime uh, characters, but it didn't quite capture the, the no theater movements. Um, so I, I think it's still quite impressive uh, what it came up with, um, but it's, it may need a little bit of, of, of editing <laughs> um, on the side of the artist. Right. Now, um, I'll move on to uh, brain science because um, AI has so many different applications, not just in storytelling, but even in brain science. So um, there were all these uh, very interesting experiments related to people looking at photographs and having their brain scanned. And what happened was um, using uh, stable diffusion, uh, the st which, is, which is this um, AI to text model, uh, it could predict what the person saw, um, even without seeing this photo. So uh, stable diffusion uh, basically uh, interpreted that the person who went under the brain scan saw um, the image on the left, which is, which is very impressive. Um, and then this is another photo uh, that the person in the brain scan saw, and stable diffusion uh, interpreted uh, the image as, as the one to the right. So, so how did that work? Um, basically, st stable diffusion analyzed the data based on the brain scans 
um, and detected uh, the, the, the blood flow. And so, some of you may wonder, like, how is that helpful? It's, it, it could be helpful even for people who have trouble communicating, um, those who suffered from strokes or, or even paralysis. And, and the same uh, applies to even the audio space. So we had people, uh, you know, th this experiment involved people who were listening to podcasts. And um, the person who was listening to the podcast heard the expression, I don't have my driver's license yet. Uh, and the AI uh, managed to decode that as she has not even started to learn to drive yet, which is, which is quite accurate. It's not word by word, but it's, it's very accurate. And so these models are able to represent, uh, this is a, a Guardian article um, title, uh, a quote from the Guardian title, uh, it says that the models are able to represent in numbers the semantic meaning of speech. So... Um, I think I'd like to go back to the uh, image of the stone, um, really just because um, I want to sort of celebrate the, the birthplace of, of humanity and um, kind of think together, you know, with, with you all in this room about the future of, of storytelling. But, but one thing I'd like to um, emphasize is, you know, there's so many, um, you know, maybe discussions that you might experience online or, you know, so something you see in the newspaper or, or on TV. Um, and it's, it's just when you observe, um, especially uh, sensitive topics that involve conflict or tension, uh, it's so easy to be involved in discussions that polarize people. But instead, you know, maybe we can think about uh, the, the humble beginnings uh, of our species and um, think about ways we can elevate uh, each other and uh, promote the advancement of humanity. So um, I'd like to end my, my remark with um, a quote from a paleoanthropologist whose name is Dr. Richard Leakey. And he was very much involved in producing a lot of the fossil evidence that forms our understanding of human evolution today. And uh, this was um, a, a transcript captured uh, on YouTube. Uh, it was a conversation between him and another paleoanthropologist. And he said, we are well within the grasp of being able to demonstrate that bigotry and prejudice has no scientific basis. And it is purely bigotry and prejudice that are driving some of the divides that separate people of the world today. And if we can make it understood and clear that irris irrespective of our superficial features, we are one people and we owe it to each other to respect each other as one species, one people with one origin, we may get over some of the hurdles um, that the 21st century is offering to us. So yes, so I'd like to end my um, talk here today and I look forward to um, your questions and comments. Thank you very much. So I yeah, thank you very much for these great lectures. Um, I have just have the privilege to ask the first couple of questions. So uh, some of the some of the picture you showed us, like generated by AI, especially around the picture of your of your father, were really striking. And you mentioning it was kind of anime or like darker. And I was wondering, in terms of uh, how do you think um, we can help AI, which is ultimately just trained with past data, to help spark our creativity for the future? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of uh, emphasis now on. The, the prompts that we add in, in generative AI and, uh, you know, the kind of questions definitely affects the output, uh, of course. And uh, even with, with documentary filmmaking, this was, was very true. Like, I, I often really focus on the quality of the questions I would ask people I filmed, um, which really kind of affected the output. But when it comes to AI, um, I think, of course, the prompt is important, but also the, the data that the AI models are trained on and ensuring that they're, they're diverse and, and that we're taking into account uh, potential biases. So, yeah, but, so, so I think it's gonna be more important than ever to really promote um, storytellers from, from all over the world and really capture the, the diverse uh, voices from, from around the world. Um, 
you know, I, I, I spoke about languages today. I mean, there are over 7,000 languages uh, spoken today. So how do we capture, you know, those, those data points? Uh, also, so when you were mentioning the, the different uh, documentary you, you, uh, you made, uh, and you mentioned earlier that it's actually places where you, you lived. So you seem to have spent a lot of time in the country uh, where you actually enter. So did you end up making a documentary uh, because you live there or living there was for you a necessary step into producing these documentaries? Yeah, um, so for example, in Brazil, um, I was there from 2006 uh, and I spent about maybe eight months in Brazil. But but I, I really wanted to go to Brazil because I had specific questions about um, you know the, the people who live uh, in, in the favelas and how the people around the favelas um, are, are reacting to them. So I, I went to places like Brazil and, and, and Lebanon knowing that I want to make a documentary there, but it was very important for me to spend six months, one year, maybe even more, um, to really get to know the people in the film, uh, gain their trust and keep on asking uh, good questions so that um, the, the output was um, as honest as possible. I have now a more like personal question. It's um, so, as I mentioned earlier, my, my kids are half Japanese, half French. So how was it for you growing up uh, uh, as a half kid in Japan? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had the opportunity to live in different countries like the UK as, as a child and uh, you know, coming coming back to Japan was was not so smooth, um, because that there, there were uh, moments of of bullying. But um, I, I I try not to focus too much on the the mixed heritage because um, ultimately we're all mixed. So, so I often talk to my partner about this, uh, who you know who studied medieval history. But it's like how how far back in history do do we want to go uh, when we look at um, our heritage? And since we all come from from Africa, <laughs> we're all essentially mixed. And so I, I try not to dwell on, on the fact that I'm you know half Lebanese, half Japanese. But of course, it's it's very helpful to have um, experiences outside of your your country and um, expand your horizon, talk to people from different backgrounds and different fields. And so. Um, you know, regardless of whether you know you're you're, you're Japanese or uh, you know from another nation, um, it's it's so important to to kind of get out of your your comfort zone. So now you launch your own company, uh, Match Hat. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, expand a little bit on that and what you are trying to achieve with that today? Sure. Yes. So um, I have a, a early stage startup called Match Hat, and, and the um, the main purpose of Match Hat is to help creatives like filmmakers, musicians, editors, actors, find uh, key collaborators for their creative projects, their passion projects, uh, really focusing on the, the field of, of film. Um, so when I was, for example, making the ninja action film, it took you know, many months to find the costume designer and sound designer, and there are lots of inefficiencies uh, in doing so. So uh, my chat is to really kind of provide this creative playground for, for creators so they can find key collaborators and get their passion projects off the ground uh, in a non-transactional setting. So there are lots of platforms out there where you can uh, outsource work and hire people um, who say, you know, I charge you know, X amount of dollars per hour, but on my chat, it's more about, um, let's see what we can achieve together and have those really meaningful conversations. Thank you. I have many more questions, but maybe first, uh, I want to open the questions to the room. So, ah, Johnny. I would just like to make a comment, not a question. So I followed your career from when you were a teenager as a no actress to becoming a filmmaker and now doing AI and social support in the network internet. And uh, I'm very proud of you. Okay. And it's amazing how you keep finding a new direction and moving on. It's not easy to do. So I think drawing on your Arab roots, we should make a documentary about you. Qu Thank you. Quoting the old Arab saying, all stories become true. Thank you so much, Johnny, for your support. It means a lot to me. Uh, and, and Johnny speaks so many different languages. Uh, each time he, he cracks jokes in different languages, which blows my mind. <laughs> um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. 
Um, I was wondering, you mentioned your father and sibling in your creative works. So I was curious, are they involved with your works or are you involving them in your work? Right, right. Oh, yeah. So um, my father has been a pioneer in, uh, you know, contemporary no theater. Of course, he's a, a no theater master and he's he's done no theater uh, from the age of three um, and, you know, really kind of... Um, done incredible work in the traditional no theater space, but also a pioneer in the uh, contemporary forms of expression as well. And so I've been observing him produce um, these uh, modern art artworks inspired by, by no theater from a young age. And uh, I think, for example, the Brazilian uh, in a government collaboration that was uh, a, a, a you know, collaboration with my father, but I, of course, um, and I, I played the role as a co-director, but I, I wouldn't have been able to, um, you know, realize that production without the support of my father, my my mother, <laughs> and everyone else. Um, but but it, it goes back to uh, what I mentioned with Match Hat and having meaningful conversations. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is that um, you know, I was talking to a friend from the Brazilian government about my passion for no theater, and he was talking about. Brazilian literature, and at that moment we said, "Let's let's make this happen," and and so I think that that's that's those are the kinds of conversations I'm I'm trying to uh, inspire on, on the Match Hat platform, like people who tell each other, "Okay, this is a little bit different, and it's going to be very challenging, but let's let's make it happen." <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, I think um, I wouldn't be here without the support of my parents and and my family. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Matoko Akiyama, and I'm a senior um, in J going to a Japanese high school right now. Um, and my question is about uh, the future of no um, and other Japanese and non-Japanese traditional cultures. Right. Um, my best friend is uh, the granddaughter of a Nihonbuyo master. Um, so I do have a little bit of, um, I've been to the National Theater and seen some of Japanese um, cultural stages or performances, but actually I've never seen no. Um, I've seen it on the screen during uh, music classes, but nothing else. So um, after hearing your presentation and the stories, um, they seem really interesting. So I really want to go and see um, no. Um, but I think that, what what do you think? Um, how do you think documentaries um, and AI um, and other social media platforms can play in on keeping no as a culture or keeping other traditional cultures all around the world um, known to people and to popularize among youth? Yeah, I think. Thank you for the question. I think it plays a huge role, right? Because when you think about the younger generation, they they spend so much time on platforms like YouTube and TikTok and other spaces. And so if there's no uh, exposure to um, you know, art forms like no theater there, I think people will just completely miss, miss that art form. And I, I think the role of, um, like we, as, as people who are in the no theater space, we have to be creative about um, sharing uh, the, the, the beauty of, of, of no theater. And we need to do that uh, in multiple platforms, you know, whether it's, it's uh, you know, social media, documentaries, or, or maybe it's um, experimentation, or maybe collaborating with interesting partners. And so um, I think we have to constantly think out of the box um, to make it uh, relevant and, and pique the curiosity of, of um, you know, the younger generation. Uh, but if, if you have any ideas, um, please, please feel free to share. Um, but I think uh, at the end of the day, we want to have these performances accessible to um, the younger generation and have them continue to talk about it, talk about, um, you know, the, the stories, um, the art form, uh, what, what made it interesting. Maybe we need to int introduce more elements of inter interactivity as well. Uh, so, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. And... Um, yeah, just continue to be curious uh, about um, traditions like no theater. Thank you. So the first question is um, from Masaru-san, and he says, no story is told in no chant in Japanese, and, can, and you cannot enjoy the story without understanding it. How important is language in communicating the artwork? Right. And then uh, just to follow, um, 
can you please tell us uh, which language was used in the Brazilian mafia? No, nope. uh, did they use captions uh, for that play? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the the role of language is is in incredibly important. Um, no theater when when the act actors are chanting, it's it's usually in 14th century uh, Japanese, and so not everyone is familiar with 14th century uh, Japanese. And plus, the intonations are slightly uh, different and, and unique, and so it, you need to sort of really pay attention to understand the meaning of no. But for example, like reading a little bit ahead of time, uh, the storyline uh, helps. And uh, maybe just kind of enjoying uh, the, the movements and, and not, you don't necessarily have to um, understand word by word, you know, what, what is um, being said or what is being chanted. But of course, um, understanding the storyline will help you enjoy the, the performance. And then when it comes to the Brazilian production, uh, my father chanted in uh, 14th century uh, Japanese, Japanese. Um, however, we had um, the uh, subtitles <laughs> uh, on on the on this you know in the in the theater space, so people could um, follow what's happening um, in, in English as well. But I think yeah, I think what's what's special about no theater is is not just the chant, but it's the music, it's the movement, it's um, how stylized uh, the, the the movements are, the symbolism as well the costumes, the, the props. Um, so it, it would be good to see it uh, in its entirety. Um, Soraya, this is a question, a personal question from myself. And because we have so many students uh, today, university students, yeah. exchange students who are thinking, you know, about their career paths going forward, you know, you have experiences, you know, your career path is so you know, you're a performer, uh, you're a filmmaker, uh, you work at, you know, big companies, you're an entrepreneur. How do you wear different hats? <laughs> right, right. Um, I think I gravitate towards, uh, you know, different fields and, and different projects and um, it keeps my creative juices flowing in, in many ways. And so, uh, of course, one of the reasons I was drawn to filmmaking is because I was curious about different subjects and I wanted to kind of promote these interesting uh, discussions with, with different audiences. Um, but I think each time I endeavor in a, in a new project, it's usually for, for, for different reasons and different um, motivations. Um, but I think uh, ultimately I love love creating, I love getting things um, off the ground and, and um, sort of experimenting with creativity as well and, and seeing um, what the next level of creativity looks like. And so that that keeps me going for sure. I thank you very much. Um, following up on um, Saoko's question, um, I'm Takaoko, I'm the senior fellow here and also I'm a professor um, at Kakushu University. And my, I couldn't help but notice that you study comparative politics um, at Princeton. And um, so the question is, how does that relate to what you do right now? Right. right. Um, and that, uh, and if I may, if I can ask a second question, I'm really curious about what you're doing right now in mm -hmm. Match Tab. Mm -hmm. and, and from this, it's an online web app connecting creators so that they can find collaborators for their passion process. Do you um, have collaborators collaborate on the art and the technique or is it like contemporary and more traditional or right. what right. kind of collaborations right. do you have in mind or are there some ongoing things that you might wanna share with us? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So comparative politics, um, I was really interested in how politics af affects uh, different societies and, and people. And so that's actually what helped me get into documentary filmmaking. Um, I, I received grants from, from Princeton um, to film in, in places like uh, Ecuador, Cambodia, Laos, uh, and, and Brazil as well. And so, um, when I was submitting my, my senior thesis, I ended up uh, submitting a documentary with it. Um, so in a way, uh, when I was conducting research, uh, field research, uh, I would take my camera with me and, and, and document the interviews. And, and so uh, I think comparative politics helped me get into filmmaking. And, uh, you know, my documentary film experience um, helped me get into uh, YouTube because they were looking for someone with production experience at the time and 
And I, I think when it comes to your, your second question about Match Hat, uh, we want to promote uh, cross-border as well as cross-field collaboration. Um, we're mostly focusing uh, on the film space and we're seeing a lot of short films being produced on Match Hat, but we see collaborations take place uh, in the Middle East, in Japan and in Europe, um, because right now uh, when you collaborate with someone on, for example, music, like let's say you have a film and you want uh, music from a composer, that composer does not necessarily need to be in the same space as you or the same city. And, and so that's one of the other reasons why uh, we're promoting cross-border collaborations. Um, but I think some of the uh, frequent use cases might be film director working with uh, actors or producers or editors and and just even to put together a short film you, you may need people from uh, different skill sets and so we, we facilitate that let me ask like one final question it's um so so it's it's a topic that we frequently have uh, that we frequently discuss uh in this room and especially this year we are the, at Asia Society, we are having the Year of Japan, where we are definitely trying to promote Japan and to, to, to think of new ways to, uh, to project uh, Japan to the world. So yourself, you've achieved like international successes. You've connected with audiences worldwide. So what advice uh, would you offer to young Japanese artists uh, to gain recognition like globally, beyond Japan? Right. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because a lot of these, um, you know, social media platforms like like YouTube and TikTok, I'm, you can really kind of find global audiences, um, you know, on these platforms. So, of course, there are many artists who are leveraging uh, social media to gain those global audiences. Um, but maybe when it comes to uh, inspiration, like you know, what kind of collaborators are, are you uh, involving? Um, you know, what kind of life experiences are, are leading to some of the inspiration for your artwork. I think, um, of course, it, you know, the, the advice will uh, depend based on the kind of uh, ambition each uh, artist has. But um, just personally speaking, when it comes to my source of inspiration, I'm, uh, it's really kind of led by curiosity. So uh, oftentimes my my work is, is shaped by certain questions I, I, I'd like to um, answer that I'm, 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 I have question marks uh, around. So that that's usually how um, I'm inspired to to take on projects. But uh, everyone will have uh, different um, motivations. Uh, but I think uh, you know the world is becoming smaller with with globalization. All these like communication tools. So how can you have these uh, you know, inspiring conversations with people from around the world and and uh, maybe even find ways to to get out of some of these silos that we tend to to be in? Because it's very very easy to be in a in a little bubble. So how can you expand your horizon by by traveling or talking to people from from diverse backgrounds? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you very much for this great presentation and the, all the questions and the topics we covered. I think it was fascinating for everyone to have like both questions on like very traditional Japanese art and then at the same time like discussing like cutting edge AI stuff. So I think it was a, it was a great discussion for that. We thank you very much uh, for all that. And I wish like all the room can join me in uh, thanking you and applauding sure. you for that. Sure. Thank you, thank you.